our guest on today's episode. Really good one. Uh, down to earth. We're going to be looking at the carnivore diet, explaining what that is, hearing some facts and myths about that, a few things that uh, might surprise you. It certainly did me. Um, looking at fitness in middle age, sustainable fitness, a little bit of conversation about martial arts, a very British guy, super down to earth, super helpful, a bit politically correct towards the end, always. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, I recommend you check him out. Okay, on the show today, Michael Mason, so a man of many talents, coach, uh, does stuff with fitness, stuff with diet, comes from strong background in martial arts, amongst other things. Um, looking forward to finding out more from him. I've, I've been following his Instagram, and I thought to myself, what do I want to look like in 10 years? I thought to myself, what, because a lot of the sort of, you know, people you see in fitness, they're 25, they're skinny, they've got no body hair. They're not proper men. And as, as someone who's 43 and wants to be in good shape at 53, I was like, well, what, you know, who should I follow? And I think someone suggested you, Michael, and uh, your channel's very popular, isn't it? You're doing well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's grown, in, it's, it's, it's grown in, in the last year. Um, I don't really know and pinpoint it, you know, what reason they're following for. Mm. Um, but I think ultimately it's, I think I'm the person who actually sort of does it um, right. day in, yeah. day, day out. And, and they can see some consistency and they can see some, I think, just some integrity, you know, I, whether I train outside or it was the, in a gym, but they can see some integrity over what I do. Well, for me, it looked real because I saw, like, this guy working out in his backyard in the UK and clearly in shape, but also with a bit of depth to it. You know, there was a, clearly some understanding there of a bit more than, you know, let's all get abs or something. And um, I, I just felt real to me in a way that a lot of the sort of influencer types don't. And I thought, okay, this is more honest and more real and something maybe I could, as a sort of middle-aged guy, relate to more than someone on a beach in Bali, you know, 25 years old, who I'm never going to be. And uh, yeah, that was what what made me follow you. And I think you know, and I, and I think with that is that especially on on social media, a lot of the influences is all about battering yourself, and right. you, you know, and 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 my training is not about I've done enough battering for myself, you know, over the years with 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 everything, and now it's that you know again like the buzzword that longevity. But it's about not battering myself and not being um, what's the, what you know what's the uh, not allowing myself just to sort of like want to get that that endorphin hit that dopamine hit for me to feel better. This is about me just being just generally better, feeling feeling good about myself, feeling strong that I can do everyday things without having an injury, um, trying yeah. to trying to do something for the, for the sake of, um, you know, some sort of crazy shit that you'll see people doing just to get sort of likes and, 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 and hits and, 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 and stuff like that. No, it makes sense. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I remember when I was doing martial arts at 18, I could just bounce off walls and be invincible. Yeah. And then I remember getting my first little tweak when I was like 21 or something with a muscle and going, Oh, and, you know, it healed in a week, of course. Now it would heal in, you know, three weeks or a month or something. And I, I overdid the gym last year. I got into weights, but I was training like I thought I was 25 and um, doing two-hour sessions. And I ended up just really sore, really tired, you know, little injuries. And someone said, look, Mark, you're training you're like, you're like you're a 25-year-old on, on, on steroids. You're not. You know, you're a guy with an office job. And, you know, now I've got a much more sustainable fitness program that actually makes me feel good for the rest of my life which is the point, right? Yeah. And, you know, and I people ask me how, how not how often I train, <clears throat> excuse me, but how long I train for. And they expect mm. me to say, oh, I'm doing two sessions a day and work out. You know, most of my sessions of, of, of training is 20, 30 minutes. I play, I play around with stuff, um, but it's just 20, it's just 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't got time to spend <laughs> two hours um, I'm not trying to batter, like I say, I'm not trying to batter myself um, to, you know, to, to win some, you know, some, you know, award or something. I'm 59. I just want to do stuff that just makes me feel good. I can feel strong and I can be doing it in 10 years time, in 20. I can carry on for the rest of my life, basically, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's mature. 
that's how it looks to me, mature, not in the sense of just years, but in the sense of attitude. And, um, yeah. Let, let's hear a bit about how you got there then, Michael, because you've, you've had a pretty interesting life from the bit of research that I've done. How did you get interested in, I know, martial arts, the body, bodyguarding? How did you get interested in these things? Well, mar you know, martial arts um, for me was... You know, and I can remember I can remember it as if it was it was yesterday. It was 1973. Um, it was the era, it was when Enter the Dragon um came out and Kung Fu, Bruce which Lee, was yes. with which was with David Carradine, which was a series that was on I mean it was on Friday night, and and I was I was hooked from that because then that's all we had. We didn't have you know internet, we didn't have Google, we didn't have any of this, we didn't have videos. And I was just completely hooked. So I enrolled in a, my parents enrolled me in a school, a karate uh, club in, in Brighton. And this was in 1973. And interestingly enough, um, last week, I was, I was meeting a friend. We were going out to, to um, get, have, some, have some coffee. And I parked in a, um, parked in a car park. And walking through the shopping centre, I saw the sensei, who uh, Ron Silverthorne, who was a sensei, who was a sensei then, and this is you know fifty years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I've looked, and and I can remember, it, I'll remember his face if it was a hundred years time. I will remember everything about. It. And he was sitting there, and I was looking at him, thinking like, "That's Ron Silverthorne." That's, that. So I said, "I said, excuse me." He said, "I said you won't remember, but are you Ron Silverthorne?" He, and he, he, he said, "Yes." Yeah. So it was, it was just, and he's ninety. He's he's got a handshake like, um, like a vice like grip. You know, he was smiling. He's still teaching in um, in Sussex, and it was just, it was just that whole. Great. Yeah, it was, Great. And, that, and it was, and it, and it was my birth. It was my birthday, and uh -huh. it was, it was just, it was to me, it was like the best birthday present. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel very fondly about all my senseis over the years in, in Brighton. I've been doing Aikido with Tom Maria Helsby for years. And, you know, the people that have gone through their dojo over the years, who've gone on to achieve things that have, you know, it's really helped their life, you know, um, yeah. in very significant ways. And um, even when I stopped training Aikido, I'd still go, you know, to the Christmas party and pop around the house once a year yeah, to yeah. say hi kind of thing. Like there's that, that relationship. And martial artists often do have that sustainability, don't they? You know they're doing it well into their seventies or eighties in many cases, and I, th I think I think it's I think especially then, whether now it will have that longevity because then it was, it was so different. Yeah. Now now it's it's not so it's 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 commonplace. It's it's like it's like football. You know, mixed martial arts is like it's like football. It's like boxing. But less, but yeah. So it's so perhaps it won't have that same. Um, long-term effect because then you know in the 70s mm -hmm. I suppose it, we we lived that dream that 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 mystical <laughs> and that was that was that was, that was part, part of, it. of it wasn't it that was part of it I remember getting into like you know and kind of there was something like this eastern esotericism and I, and I guess it wasn't so sports or in tech like MMA I was just in a jiu-jitsu club Brazilian jiu-jitsu club and it was very much lined up for what's the competition that's coming next yeah. And yeah, that's kind of a young man's game to some extent, right? Of course, there's masters and things like that. And um, I worry that while I love the modern martial arts, I think they're very effective. I think they're great for fitness. Um, the MMA and the things associated with that, I was in Thai the other day. Um, I, I worry that they've lost some of the personal growth aspect and some of the sustainability for people to be training, you know, into their old age. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think there's, I mean, I think there's, um, I think, it, I think it's, a, I think it's a fine line. I think with, with some, let's say, traditional martial arts, they, they've gone so far off the mm. scale in, 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 a, in, a, in a, neg in, a, in a negative way, drawing people in with that mysticism, yeah. covering stuff up because they don't actually have the ability to sort of to teach the, the you know, the, the deeper levels. Especially in Japan, in 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 Japan. You lived there and, for a bit, right? You were in yeah. Japan for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to go. I used to go there and 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 train there, and and I think it's so people see is that's gone too far. Like what you know, you know one, you know one mm. way, and obviously let's say 
modern day martial arts has become so sport and, and competition orientated, it's gone, you know, another way. But I think there's a place for elements with, with everything, especially with, let's say, the modern day stuff, because, you know, I started martial arts, one for the mysticism when I was a nine year old, but I also wanted to fight. I wanted to yeah. do all, yeah. I wanted to do all this stuff. And and a lot of traditional stuff have lost that actual combatability of that of, of that self of that real sort of self defense. And you don't so need it in it, Japan, though, do you? Do you know what I mean? I'm, like I, you don't need it in Japan. I, I remember going to um, Aikido Hombu Dojo in Japan, and it was absolutely beautiful uh, practice. Beautiful guys every morning, you know, doing their practice, sustainable. But I thought these guys are never going to be in a fight. They don't have yeah. like it's Japan's safe. Yeah. I mean, even Shinjuku in Tokyo is safe. Yeah. You know? And yeah. um, I thought they don't have that that emphasis. And that can almost almost takes away the, the base somehow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You need you I think you need that you need that stress of you know of you know of real life of of just but you know basic things of you know walking down the street and being you know and, and being aware of of of, you, of your surroundings, which now you know, everywhere we've lo- we've lost that because everyone's on their their phone. They have they have <laughs> situational awareness. They have they have no you know they have no uh, you know a, you know awareness of, and it's just it's just simple stuff. I mean that is that self defence. It's not yeah. le- it, you know you can learn you can learn the most let's call it the most effective move technique there is. But if you're unaware and you get ambushed, you're fucked. Yeah, sometimes someone asks me for like a war story about martial arts. And I say, you know, there's this one time in Ethiopia, these three guys tried to jump me. And they said, what did you do? You know, they expected me to say, I did this like wrist lock or this throw. And I said, oh, I had a newspaper in my hand. And I saw the first one coming. And I just hit him over the head with the newspaper and told him to fuck off. And the other two run. And I was like, I was like, that was, to me, that was perfect self-defense because no one got hurt. I didn't get hurt. And I was situationally aware enough to go, this is a bit weird, this situation. And the only thing I had in my hand was a newspaper. So that, yeah, that wasn't some ninja technique. It was just get out of here, mate. Yeah, but the thing is with that, they used to call that the Millwall punch. And the Millwall, and, and, and the Millwall punch was what the football hooligans used to walk into a game with, with a newspaper. And with the newspaper, if you roll it up tightly and you fold it, You've got a something kosh. that you've got. You've got pretty much a cost. You put put that into someone's face, and that as a self defense is a really really good, um, um, tool, let's call it yeah. weapon to have. Yeah. You know, same with magazines. But now we don't. People don't have newspapers. You know, I was and, thinking and, about getting a spike put in my iPhone. So I, was, I said to my wife the other day, I said, "What." I said, if we get jumped walking down the street, what's in my can likely to be in my hand? And she's like, yeah. well, your phone. And I said, oh, okay, I should get a spike put on the end of there, you know, because I've, I've got that in my hand anyway. Maybe that's the paranoid martial artist speaking, but let's get back to your life because it's interesting. How did you end up doing um, uh, bodyguarding? Tell us about that. So bodyguard, bodyguarding really sort of came from um, one way, but there's two things. One might experience with with martial arts but also um culturally i'm jewish and within a jewish community um we were always brought up to look after our own so it came it came it came it came really really from 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 from, from that so you know i did you know i went over to israel to train to learn, you know, learn stuff how to how to protect people, how to protect the communities, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so it just it just came, it just came from, you know, from, from from that. And 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 again, it was, I suppose this this thing from from you know from a from a kid, you know, from that nine year from that nine year old kid, watching martial arts uh, programs, and seeing, you know, the good guys. Beating up the bad guys, the good guys protecting people, the yeah. good guys, you know, um, putting their life on, you know, on, you know, on the line. Yeah, that never again, isn't it? You know, when you when your people have suffered and been put through hell, and I, I I've been to Israel twenty times and got a lot of friends that do crab, 
And uh, you see that feeling of protectiveness, which I think is a very wholesome, natural, masculine urge to go, you know what, I'm going to look after my family because there are bad people out there. Yeah. And interesting enough, today is um, Holocaust Day. And talking about Krav Maga, I was the... I was one of the first, there was there was a group of us, um, and I was one of the first UK instructors for Krav Maga, and this was back in the the the, uh, the early the early 90s before it became it became sort of like mainstream. And even with that, you know, Krav Maga has has changed. You know, it's 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 evolved. It's it's a different sort of um Yes, yeah, a different thing than it than it than it, than it used to be. So different context, yeah, yeah. And what's bodyguarding like? I've got no experience of that. Never done anything, anything like that. What's it like? I imagine there's a lot of standing around being bored, or like, how is it? Well, I think there's I think there's elements d- depending on what type of um, what type of client you've got, what type of, of of scenario. It can be sort of like 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 anything. You know, if you're watching, if you're in someone's house and you're watching the, the security cameras, that for anyone is is just bore, you know, bore, you know, bore, you know, boring work. Um, but that's where the, I suppose ultimately that's where the the skill comes in in into not allowing it to be boring. So you, again, uh-huh. you're aware because the bad guys know that the bad guys know that people have these dips in attention in awareness. And they're experts for finding the mm-hmm. weak link. So, so yeah, it can be it can be sort of like boring. I was lucky in that um, a lot of my work was with let's call it interesting people, and and I did a lot of the, a lot of my work when I was in Switzerland. So um, Geneva well as, or Zurich or. Oh, no, well, I was I was I was a ski instructor as well. Oh. So, so, so one of the things that I, you know, that one of my my other sort of tests, the ski instructor, and so I used to look after clients. I lived in a very exclusive resort, um, and you'd get lots of um, not necessarily high profile, but high, you know, extremely high net worth. Um, Which one? Okay, I know I used to work ski resorts myself in Switzerland, so I'm just very. Curious. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So plenty of money, people skiing around. So plenty of money. So I used to have clients who would come on holiday and I would look out, I would look after them. And so my role as a ski coach bodyguard was people say, well, it's it's two sort of like different things. And it's well it well, it wasn't because as a as a ski instructor, my job is to get you from the top of the mountain down to the bottom of the mountain or wherever safely. That's you know, that's part uh-huh. of it. So as a bodyguard. That's that's my, that's my job to get you from point A to point B, in you know in one you know in one piece. So I would get clients who wanted, who would already have their security, but their security couldn't ski, and and they just uh, wanted. And so rather than going to someone who was a eighteen year old ski instructor, they wanted someone who knew what they were doing with a bit of experience, um, and also knew which. Uh, which were the good restaurants to eat in, and what was on, and what was on, and what was on the, you know, that what was on 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 the menu, yeah. um, that, and that's and that's your local local experience. And with a bodyguard, having local experience, you may not be as technically uh, adept as someone else bodyguard, but if you have that local experience, you're a better guy to be with because you know what exit points, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, local, wherever I've been traveling abroad, the local guides are always, always absolutely key. I used to look after rich people's kids in Switzerland yeah. on ski slopes. I used to yeah. sk- uh, snowboard around with their kids, the, the sort of hyper-rich British uh, tourists. So it was a fun job, actually, for a couple of years. Beautiful place as well, right? Like, quite a quite a place to live. I think I think anywhere in the mountains, anywhere in the mountains with snow is just is just beautiful. It doesn't It doesn't really matter... You know, whereas, but obviously the Alps have um, have just that magical. They just have that that magic, special, that, ma- that, ma- yeah. that magic, that magic, that magical feeling. You you do stuff in Scotland now, right? Which is also beautiful, of course. We shouldn't shouldn't neglect the homegrown British Isles for foreign shores. Uh, you're doing retreats in Scotland, so I'm doing a, a, a do carnival retreats in in the Highlands. It's um, in a, a former hunting lodge. 
in Glen Canich, and it's a it's a really remote glen. It's not a tourist glen. It's on a um, hunting estate. It's absolutely beautiful, um, as 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 the high as the Highlands are. I mean, I think people don't realise how beautiful Scotland is because they have mountains, they have big hills, they have mountains. It's not very, um, it's not populated. It, and it's just, it's just, it's just beautiful. And for, and for me, you know, there's lakes and locks and it's just, it's just beautiful. And it's, you're getting back to, you know, just a natural way of, not say necessarily living, but just a natural viewpoint of, you know, looking at beautiful mountains, beautiful scenery, and the season, and it doesn't really matter when you, I think when you're living somewhere like that, it doesn't really matter what the weather's doing. You know, if it's pissing down, it still it still has it's, its still beauty. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. If, it, if it's, it's cold, if it's cloudy, because you get all the colouring, you get all the different shades of grey um, at the reflections, and it's just so it's just so I run a, a carnival retreat. Um and that incorporates pretty much everything that, that I do. So it's the essence of me. The essence of you, awesome. What a great thing to sell. Let's talk about carnival then. We've never had anyone on this podcast talking about it. We're not really a health and fitness podcast. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're looking more at the psychological side of the body. But I think people are interested in it. And I, I personally am. Like I notice I get very tired if I have carbohydrates during the day. So I try and avoid that. I'm living a lot of meat and vegetables rather than sort of starchy carbs. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in it. Jordan Peterson, I think, made it kind of yeah. famous, and his daughter, yeah. Michaela. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to be something that's popular. A few years ago, everyone would say, be a vegan, and then everyone noticed that vegans were pale and weak and whiny. Yeah. Um, so, And then the carnival sort of become the latest thing. Uh, just like from the very basic, tell us a little bit about it, if you wouldn't mind. So just my sort of like, you know, you know, you know history, my let's call it my nutrition history has just been a, an, an involvement from when I was in my twenties, because I wanted to see, I wanted to try different things. I wanted to see, well, how does that work? How do I, you know, perform, you know, perform with that, you know, let's call it eating a clean, you know, I've never really eaten, eaten shit for a long time. I've, I've had eaten shitty stuff, but it's not, let's say every day for, I've been eating crap for you know for two for two years, so I tried different things. You know, I tried um, you know the ju juicing craze, uh, craze um, uh, protein and carbohydrate, not combining them. Um, I became vegetarian because I wanted to try uh, being a vegetarian. I became I was I was vegan for the last oh, that was for three years. I was vegan for part of that because I wanted, and this was in the late eighties. Um, where there was no, you couldn't Google anything. You had to go and buy, I had to go to libraries to sort of like find books, yeah. or, you know, how, you know, what do you do with mung beans and, and you know, all. Brighton all, pubs you know, didn't have a vegan option, even in Brighton at that stage. Yeah. But they had it, but they had a very good, they had a very good vegetarian um, shop called Infinity. If you. Oh, that's great. Yeah, great shop. In, yeah. In, 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 in Infinity Foods. And they were still, you know, they, they were selling it then, things like veggie bacon and like vegan bacon. There's some things like, well, hold on. If you don't, if you want to save the animals, why are you eating something that's that's still got bacon on it? You know, it's like anyway, that's the. That. So it's just been sort of like um, you know, uh, in 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 involvement of that, and you know, I notice differences when you're in your twenties. It's pretty much you can do anything. Yeah, you can you can do anything, and then as I got into my thirties, I I noticed that things would like things would change. Body body was changing. <laughs> And 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 so I was like, well, how do I, you know? So I just kept on, kept on, kept on, and and the carnivore, let's call let's call it let's call it low carb, because you know Atkins was doing, you know Atkins were doing like low carb, um, high protein, you know, early 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 seven you know seventies. So I started playing around with with that and starting to discard. I never liked vegetables. I never liked it. Never liked vegetables as a kid. I never believed in um, Popeye with you know with 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 with, with, the, yeah. with the spinach. I never you know it, and I said I remember like talking to Anthony Chaffee on on, a, on another podcast. It's like this was what we were brought up to look at someone 
the sa- Popeye the sailor as kids as like the, as like the hero. He ate spinach and he smoked a pipe. You know, and it's like, well, <laughs> you, you you know, it, it's you couldn't get away with you couldn't get away with that, that you know that now. So it's just been an evolution. And once I started to get rid of that attachment to vegetables and thinking, oh, you've got to eat vegetables because they're 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 healthy for you, etc. Eat your broccoli, it's do good. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and and then starting to dive you know into that, and then. You know, over time, it's just, you know, get less and less and less and less, more protein. And especially as you, you know, especially as you get older, you know, if we can hang on to the muscle that we have, and if we can build lean tissue as we get older, that is, that's what we have to do as, you know, as, 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 as we, as, as we get older. I mean, it's, a, it's as simple as, it's a, it will improve our longevity, it will improve our life. So, okay. so I'm not a, Let's call it one of these fundamental um, carnivores, um, because I think it's very, very difficult for very, very few people that are going to just stick to meat and salt and water. <laughs> right, you, you, know, you, have, yeah. I, you have sauce, don't you? At least I saw on your you know, made me very hungry looking at your. I like, you know, I like I, I, I like <laughs> cooking. I like making things sort of like tasty. So I, I use spices. I'll cook with vegetables if I'm making a stock or if I'm making a making a, a stew. Every now and then I'll have I'll have some fruit, especially in in the summer. Um, but I don't go you know overboard with that. And and the result is is that one I feel really really good. And you were talking bef- before about you know this isn't a health and fitness is your your podcast is more sort of like let's say psychologically. But what we eat. It's the basis. It's the foundation, it's, right? It's, Don't it's, ignore it's, it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it, you know, if, you know, effect, you know, affects, you know, affects that. And I've just found that dealing with shit situations, emotional shit situations, that my mindset is just far, far better when I'm eating um, the way the way that I am now, as opposed to how I was reacting to things. Let's say. Yeah. 10 years ago again mm. breath work training all of those things come you know it's part of it you know a, you know, a, you know, a part you know a part of it it's it's the holistic approach um but yeah i mean i eat a, a high protein diet very very few carbs hardly mm. any vegetables and and i feel great and, I'm, and i try and make things tasty you look great and i have to say you know like i looked at you and went oh yeah it looks like a healthy bloke more than that, this might embarrass you slightly, but a, a female member of my staff said, oh, good, you're getting that guy on. He's tasty looking, was what she said. Uh, a very young, beautiful woman. So, um, yes, my female staff are admiring this, uh, admiring you from afar, you should know, on Instagram. So um, <laughs> I was like, okay, well, I, I, you know, it'd be nice if someone's saying that about me in my 50s. So um, something is definitely going right. But as you say, it's how you feel, not just how you look as well, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's I mean, there's plenty of people, there's plenty of people who look fantastic, but they're screwed up. Mm. You know, mm. we, we don't have we don't have to look. You know, we don't have to look very far because everyone is. People are thinking that body composition is what's going to make them, you know, you know, feel good, and it's it it will have an effect. Yeah, but it's there's other stuff. Got there's other stuff that you've got to deal with. And accept and um yeah let's talk about carnivore a little bit more then so a couple of things I, i'm thinking about it right now um yeah. first of all i was going to do a reduction diet i've got a few little niggly health problems i've had for ages and i, I thought oh, okay do reduction diet someone said start on brown rice and add things someone else said start on steak and add things and i thought that sounds much fucking better i think that's the plan i'm going to follow um but then i thought to myself i, I, I can't just eat steak forever like, i love meat but the idea of, you know, doing what Jordan Peterson does, of just having steak, I thought, no way. I mean, like, I guess this sort of still doing, like, some vegetables. I was having a curry two nights ago with my wife. Yeah. And I thought to myself, okay, this is soaked in oil, which is probably terrible for my testosterone levels. And the rice is certainly very Moorish. The idea of never having a curry again certainly doesn't appeal to me. Um, and I can see potentially huge benefits in this and certainly more sustainable for me to have a healthy meat diet 
than I think it was when I was trying to be vegan and ended up just miserable and weak and snapping one day on the streets of Moscow and just going, screw this, and going for a steak. I distinctly remember the moment where I just went, I've had enough on a dark winter's day in Moscow. Um, so, yeah, what, speak to some of the concerns people might have. Like someone said, hey, you're going to get constipated. Someone else might say, hey, I, I'm going to miss chips or rice with my curry. Someone else might say, you know, hey, is that ethical? Like what are some of the objections people have to it? So just with, you know, just with that, um, you know, all of whenever we start anything, whatever it is, the biggest barrier is the mindset. Mm-hmm. And you and you, and you said it, you know, immediately. Oh, but how can I eat steak for the rest of my, my, my life? One has to break it down. Time. You have to. You have to bring. You know. You have to. Doesn't matter about tomorrow, next week, three months time. You start today. You eat steak today. You take it. And for me, it's like this. Not probably one of the most important things. One day at a time. I know it's like a, a cliche. Yeah, it works. But it really is. Oh, how am I never going to have curry again? I love curry. I I've got I've got a mate. Um, we've known each other over thirty years. We've trained for over thirty years in martial arts together, and we used to every you know every month or so, especially when I was living abroad and coming you know coming back, go to a restaurant in Seaford. It's an Indian restaurant, and have a, have um, have an have an Indian. And you know, I love I love Indian food. I love English Indian food. Traditional British Indian, nothing British, better. Nothing you, you know. <laughs> and you know, Peshwari naan, Papa Doms, um, onion barges, chicken tikka masala, you know, taka dal, the, the whole lot. And I feel great. Always, always, the day after, I feel shit. The day after, I'll still be sort of feeling sort of like cranky and 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 and, and what have you. Now we don't. Now we don't sort of like you know, you know you do that because it's like well, one I can't I can't I don't like feeling like shit. However, if there was an occasion where I'm just going to think, okay, I'm going to I'll I'll have it. I'm prepared to take the consequences of feeling. I'll I will have it and you know and eat everything. And again, I mention this because I've got a, I've got a very, very good friend of mine. He's got, he's a two-star Michelin chef, has one of the best restaurants in in in, in the country. We're good pals. He invites me up. We do weekends. We do like boys' weekends and what, what have you. He does all the cook. Well, he it's knows he he knows what I do. Yeah. You know he you know he 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 said he. For my birthday, he said, you know, he said he sent me down a whole load. He sent me down a whole load of steaks. Mm. You know, got this big, got this big, big box, and it's just, it's just a box full of, full of ribeye that he gets from his. He's got one of the best butchers in the country. It was, it was, it was like, you know, it's like fat, you're, fat, you're fantastic. But I'm not going to sort of. I'm going to do that as a, spe- as a, as a treat. I'm going to eat the bread because he makes fantastic sourdough. I'll eat. I'll eat everything. I'll take the consequence if I feel a bit rough, but I'm not going to be up my ass and just say, yeah, "Oh no!" It's like this is, you know, this is about living and and you know and just having um, what's the word? I can't, I can't think, I can't, I can't think of the word. So, so back to the point is that if you want to make a change, you, you one is thinking about doing carnival, then try it one day at a time. Don't think about oh, but I fancy Chinese. Will I not ever have that? that again what will happen is that once you get used to eating that way you'll eat something and you think oh this doesn't feel good no it's a the difference same, yeah the same you know the same with you know, let's go back to to indian we're so used to people are so used to things like you know, like, like like farting having the shits and what have you but they think that's normal with or having a burning ass that's normal <laughs> way to be and it we, everyone laughs about it thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. But really, is is that a normal that sort of? Is do it? Get, is that? Do you get constipated with all the meat? No, I don't at all. Um, you don't. You, you know, meat meat is a very low residue food, so you may not poo as much. I mean, if you're eating loads of vegetables and everything, there's loads of fibre, yeah, yeah, which which is not which is not digested, and then it get it, it get it get then get stuck in the colon. Um, that's more likely to cause you. Um, 
constipation, but the body has to go through a change. The the, the gut uh, microbiome has to change. If it's used to, if it's a car, you know, if if the car is used on petrol and you yeah, change it, it has to, you know, you have to make some changes. So the gut will start to change to create bacteria to break down um, the meat, etc. So there will be a period where you, some people will get um, constipated for a few days. Some people it be a few days longer, but you have to persevere. You have to go through that. Like anything, you go to, if you start training, you go to a gym that you haven't been to a gym for a few months or a few years. You're going to ache for a few for a few days, and that's what stops people because they oh fuck it. I went to the gym yesterday. I don't, I don't feel good because I can't move. I can't sit down and have a shit and everything. I'm not going back again. But I have had about two weeks off. I have two weeks off the gym. It starts to hurt again. But if I go every two or three days, it's a pleasure. I mean, exactly. how, how long do you try it for then? If like if I was to give this a go, I'm a big believer in actually experimenting and see if something works for me. You know, do the experiment, I think. Like, what would you recommend people do as a starter? Or do you to gradually go into it or just, just go straight and have like two weeks or... Well, I think there's. I mean, there's. I think. I think there's. I think there's. I think there's two ways. If you gradually go into it, but you're still sticking to, I'll get. I can get back onto the, the brown rice thing in, in a minute. But if you're still sticking to, let's say, crappy food, which is going to give you um, that that sort of feel, sort of good factor, the stuff that you can end up like over, you know, overeating. I mean, you know, if you can control that, okay, well, then you start eating less of that, incorporating more meat. But I think the best way is that you just go fully into it um, and you do it for at least 30 days. And then you just then you just start, you know, you, you know, you, you have to start playing around with it. I think everyone wants a um they want what's the diet give me give me the list of you know what you know yeah. what you know what to do they want they want the they want you to give like the answer and the answer comes from you the answer comes from you from your own experience of like oh oh i had too much bacon or i had too much fat and maybe need to turn that down I'm, i feel better with red meat or that that chicken i had um didn't satisfy me as much as why you know, do some there's... people go just beef and other people say lamb is very good? I knew one person that just ate just lamb for a month and got sick of it and never ate lamb again. Um, I would, some people say chicken's not great. I mean, like, do you think there's, is it different makeups, different amount of well, there, sort of factory breeding and stuff? Well, there is differences. So, you know, lamb and beef are ruminant um, animals, so they can eat pretty much anything, you know, you know grass, and, and they already generally sort of like eating grass um, and 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 you know, all of that. So it's a much, much healthier diet and they can process it. Chicken, and unless you get fully pastured, aged chicken, one, the chickens in this country are uh, that you get a young, they haven't had time to develop, but they're fed generally on corn and soy. They're not, they're not left to, and, and especially they're not left to sort of like scratch around even your so free range chickens or yeah, your organic chickens. Yeah, yeah. so organic chicken may mean that the, the feed they've been given is organic soy. Organic and, and, soy. Uh, and 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 the, the satiety effect that I if I was to, I love chicken, you know, I like you know having chicken thighs getting more crispy. But if I if if I was to have, let's say, um, let's say 500 grams of a good piece of steak for me to get the same sort of feeling of let's call it nourishment or even satiety. I need I need to eat three times the amount of chicken. Right, right. And there was a um Parvel is a is a kettlebell coach, like famous guy. Oh yeah, yeah. And and he was going on about you know like 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 it was like remember years ago like oh I'll eat chicken but chicken's a weak animal because it Itch. can't even fly. Chicken is a weak animal. I do not eat weak animal. Yes, yeah. I understand. And 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 again, I, I've got a group, and we were having a, I've got a private uh, group, and we were having a chat on 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 Zoom on on Sunday, and I was just saying, well, if I had to go to, you know, if the zombies were coming in, oh, uh, and right, and you could only have, let's say, right, you've got, you can only eat this, 
or that you can have whatever you want but you can well for me it's going to be beef it's going to be bread meat because that's where i feel like the strongest anything else chicken, venison boar i mean like I've, well, ve- I mean, well, ve- well, ve- well venison 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 again would be would be a, a good choice if it, if it if it was wild lamb would be a good choice but good beef you know it just makes me feel sort of uh really again with pork pork again um is is fed because it's it's not because people want the fat so it, it's 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 fed that it's not a wild and wild boar a lot of the times it's generally sort of like quite lean and we need to have we need to have we need to have the fat because otherwise that's what you're burning instead of carbs right yeah like you, like at times when i've had no carbs at all a couple of times i was cutting for a fight i felt really weak i guess because my system was used to the carbs but it's also I was yeah. pretty low fat at that point as well. I, yeah. I kind of cut much lower than now. Um, so I mean, your system's essentially burning that fat as its main energy source, right? Well, there's 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 that, but also fat contains all the fat soluble vitamins. Yeah, yeah, A, D, E. So, so, so you're getting all the nutrients, um, you know, you know, you know, you know, from, you know, from, you know, especially you know, you know, you know, you know, vitamin D. If we, if we don't have vitamin D, we can't produce we can't produce testosterone. If we don't have cholesterol. We can't produce. Right, can't that's, what produce made out. that's what it's made out. It's made you out know, of fat. So, so, so all this stuff, and and obviously, I'm not going to get it because people say, "Well, Mike, you're not a doctor, you're not a PhD, so you shouldn't be talking about stuff." But there's Doctors plenty of people. Anything. But the thing is, with that, is that our brain is 70, 80 percent cholesterol. Our cell walls are cholesterol. If we don't have cholesterol, we die. And yet, the most, um, the biggest drug in the world, statins. Is 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 which going to reduce people's cholesterol? Yeah, let's talk about this on another podcast in relation to your mother. And I also figured out a while back that doctors, particularly GPs, they're you know doing the best job they can, stressed than the NHS usually in this country. But um, they don't know much about exercise and diet and sleep and testosterone levels. They don't know much at all about that stuff. And sometimes the advice they give is. Um, amateurish beyond belief actually like like if they googled it a little bit they'd give better advice but the thing is they don't have the time yeah no no, no disrespect he, to doctors yeah, they, are... they, they they don't they don't they don't have they don't have the time um they're given very very little nutrition tr- uh, training and what they're given is from the standard standard book you know, and those you books are biased, right? Like you look at the stuff that's going on in the US at the moment, like oh, this, this farming it's industry, crazy. pharmaceutical industry, sugar industry. It's just massively controlling the advice the government's given it. And that's not a conspiracy theory. Like it's like clearly these are the funders of the studies and the the, the government bodies. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. And and because ultimately they want to sell you a pill. They want to sell you some sort of drug um, rather than some type of dietary um, exercise or let's call it mindset intervention, you know, to help you. So I, a couple of days ago, I saw on, it was a clip that was from on, on 60, 60 Minutes and it was a doctor who just been um, voted onto the U.S., Dietary Guidelines Committee, or one of the one of the committees, is is a, a government body. Um, Dr. Fatima Cody, if I remember remember right, and she was saying that if you're obese, it's genetic. Yeah, and nothing you can do you, about it, and and nothing you can do about it. So even with optimal, these are her words. Even with optimal diet, optimal exercise sleep and stress management you're still going to be a beast um she is funded because there was another link that she's funded by a pharmaceutical company um and then it goes on to yeah they just want to sell you a pill so whatever you're doing um but then it goes on to prove that she doesn't believe her own government's dietary advice because to her she's thinking that's the optimal diet they don't believe that that works so, and then you get people saying, but Mike, you know, you just eat meat all day, blah, blah, blah. You know, it can't be healthy. Well, look at me, for fuck's sake. 
you know, so it's like, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. It's, it's it's screwed. It's screwed up. Well, I'm glad there's people out there sort of you know putting the record straight. And um, sometimes you know there's a lot of pushback against gurus like Helen Lewis's series. You know, she doesn't like people giving advice on the internet. And I'm like, well, sometimes that advice is better than governments are giving, and we do need to be discerning. We do need to check the science and kick the can a bit. But um, yeah, I'm glad there's people you know giving advice like you. I, I recommend highly people follow your fitness stuff on instagram um do you want to give your instagram and any websites just so people know where where to find you so i'm simply on instagram as as mason survival and that's it. great and michael mason people will find it as well and your scottish retreat i found from a google search uh, so there's another Michael Mason who's at some university, but I found that that Scottish retreat you mentioned. Not me. <laughs> yeah, there's another one. And it's, it's like, but it was, yeah. it was like second or third on the list for Michael Mason or Michael Mason uh, Fitness. I think it comes up as well. Great. Uh, just the last few minutes. Then. Is there anything we haven't touched upon that would be good for you to just mention? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, nothing I can think of unless you want to ask me anything specifically. I, nothing I, I, yeah. No, it's been good. It's been good. So, um, and testosterone, is that something you look at? I mean, I know it relates to the diet side of things. Like, as men get older, that seems to be a, an issue for men. Well, it, it, you know, again, it's it's one of the things that people sort of, like, ask me or they make a comment, uh, generally like a negative comment, or, oh, shit, you can't be doing this at 59. You Why don't you become honest and tell everyone that you're on steroids or testosterone? And, you know, the fact is that I'm not. Testosterone, I don't know enough about, you know, you know about it. And there was a, Dave Asprey a few weeks ago uh, was mentioning that if you're over 40 and you're male, that you need to take testosterone, otherwise you're fucked. And I sort of like rebutted again, you know, you, you know, buzzed it. I said, well, hold on a minute. No, you don't. Are you telling me people that you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to have have that you've got to have something you've got to go and buy a product when you can just improve your testosterone markers by a good diet mm -hmm. a good training stimulus yeah good sleep yeah. stress management etc you know etc yeah. those et four et things will take care of a lot those, of what people think of as aging is that they've got shit diet shit sleep stressed out of their mind sedentary jobs don't lift weights and then they call it aging and I, my, like, I see someone like you who I, I can just feel has decent testosterone. Like, as a guy, I can just feel that. Like, if I walk down the street in Brighton, I feel the opposite normally. I walk by guys and I just go, it's a different feeling as a man, you know? And, and the, the, the research shows that testosterone levels are like a, a half what they were even 20 years ago, and that's yeah. half what it was 50 years before. Yeah. So our testosterone levels on average are a quarter what they were pre-World War II. That's yeah. mental, yeah. like a quarter. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of wonder how that's impacting society. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on the sort of bigger picture here of, um, you know, more vegetarian, less testosterone-y kind of guys walking around the world. I mean, this is one of the reasons I left Brighton, if I'm honest, is it, 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 I just didn't like being in that, that soup. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and and I think I think that whole scenario, what it, what it could end up becoming, is is quite sort of is quite is scary, um, and how one manages it in terms of like having your you know opinion. Obviously, you've got the guys who are sort of like ultra masculine. Let's say like Andrew Tate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you know that that attracts people. Also puts a whole load of people off, and I don't know any more about him than 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 than, yeah. than that. But this this whole thing where I don't, I, I suppose I'm too old to get my head around this gender stuff and non-binary, and I don't I, I I identify with with this, and 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 I. I to me, it's I just don't I understand that people do have um let's call them issues. Um and I don't mean to 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 offend anyone, but if you have a population that's that's weak and doesn't say anything and everything's okay, it's okay to be unwell, it's okay to be ill, 
because you can just go to a doctor and get a pill. It's okay to be, it's okay to be fat because we shouldn't be fat shaming. I don't fat shame you know anyone. But to me, if you're obese, then you're sick. Then you're not. Then you're not well. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's not okay to be weak because you know, you're a li- you're a liability to loved ones. Yeah, and you can't you can't you you can't you can't look after anyone. You can't, you know, you can't, yeah, you can't look after anyone. You can't look after yourself. Yeah. yeah and and, say, a weak, sick population is a compliant one. Yeah. Right. So, you know, gender stuff aside, that's pretty complicated. There's a few factors in there, but I think certainly we can agree on, you know, weak, ill. This is not a good thing. Let's, let's, and there has to be a middle ground between, you know, shaming people that have had tough lives or tough genetics or tough social situations, you know, the Gabal Mate stuff. And then that's, you know, that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end is saying, yeah, this, this is, it's totally okay that testosterone levels are a to what they were, that everybody's obese, that everyone's sick. Like, this is not okay. This is not good that people are mentally yeah. ill. Like, just yeah. walk through the streets of Brighton, the levels of mental illness are just tangible. The levels of addiction are tangible. And all the stats back that up. Well, I was in. I went to London. Um, I go to London, every, you know, every, every every now and then, and went um, to meet other other carnivals. We had to be had to be had to be had some dinner up there, you know. And just going on the underground, and you looking at. Uh, and yeah. I've always been a people watcher. Yeah, I suppose that's what made Same. me a good bodyguard. Mm-hmm. Like, I I like watching people, and watching them, you know, on the train, and I'm just like looking around. I'm, you know, everyone is fucked. Yeah, they look terrible in London. Everyone don't they? looks just, just. <laughs> the women fucked. look ten years older than they should look. The guys look weak. It's like no one looks well, man. Yeah, there's no way to live. Vaping and and you know, it, it's, it's like it's like fucking hell. If it was making people happy, I'd say fill your boots. But it's clearly not making people happy with the addiction and depression and anxiety. You know, it's yeah. clearly not. Yeah. Listen, we need to wrap up. It's nice to be a bit politically incorrect with you, uh, Michael. I appreciate it. And as I said I do rep- uh, recommend everyone check him out if you're listening to this on the podcast. Particularly all you middle-aged ladies who follow this podcast, you really should go and objectify Michael on his Instagram, like my staff have been doing. Ah, never mind. Okay, Michael, a pleasure. Thanks for joining Mark, us. Mark, thank you very much. Pleasure. My well, Walkshire, if you like that, you'll probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app. Um, so on both of these things, you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here, um, some exclusive ones with some big names, some people you'll probably recognise that are over there. Um, there's um, a copy of my book, PDF, of my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to people like. I sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga. And you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free, and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.